this is go bring Bill. That's the sub, subtext of being behind enemy lines because as a people of God, we're supposed to be going. We're to go into all the world. We get that. We're supposed to be proactive in our faith, not just, you know, laissez-faire, kick back, relax, chill. We're supposed to be active in our faith, going. I mean, you've heard it said, the first two, two letters of God's name, right? G-O, go. Go, 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 go. And that's what he expects from us. And he expects us to bring, right? And I'll just, on the record, what he wants us really to bring are the true riches of the kingdom. Now, who knows what the true riches are? Anybody? Bible scholars out there? True riches are what? People, souls. That's really what it's all about, is, is bringing people to a place where they can have right relationship. Amen? And we build. And we should first be building ourselves. And if we're not building ourselves, well, you probably fall apart. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I used to have forearms like Popeye. I used to do 300 push-ups a day. 300. Can you imagine, you know, what I look like without a shirt on? <clears throat> I used to be proud of that, but uh, now, you know, because I haven't been building, I haven't been doing those push-ups, you know, those forearms aren't there anymore. They go away. You know, on that chest that was, you know, so it was worthy, you know, <laughs> has sunken a little bit, right? You know, it's... If you're not building, you're losing. I mean, and that fits in our spiritual life too. If we're not building, what are we doing? We're just, you know, just yikes. And we're supposed to build. We should be building ourselves. But it's not all about us. See, if life is all about us, I promise, if life is all about you and it's all about what you need and, you know, what's going to make you happy, you're going to need Prozac. You're going to need some kind of mood-enhancing uh, 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 substance because you'll find out that when you do life all about you, that becomes very shallow and empty. See, God intended us to do life about others or with others. But that's why he created Adam and Eve. He didn't leave Adam all on his own with the animals. You know? He, he created him a helpmate. He created a partner for Adam. And then, you know, they had kids, and then pretty soon the whole world was overrun with people. It's all about people. You know, I was in a conversation with Elder Hale, Elder Ken Hale. He's still at second service here. And we were just talking. We were just sitting and just have, you know, some time one afternoon. And, and the questions he was asking me just lit a fire within me. And, you know, and I just started just going, and I had to apologize. I said, now I'm getting my preach on in the room. He's like... <laughs> You know, it, it, and the, the point, that just the, the fact that I was already processing some stuff and he just stirred me up some more. And I want to bring some of that uh, this, this weekend and also next weekend and give you a little insight into, you know, kind of what went on behind the scene there. But there is a theme throughout the Bible. The Bible does have a theme. And really it boils down to relationship and warfare. God has always been about restoring people to right relationship with Him. Right? When Adam and Eve fell, He immediately stepped in to reunite them so that they could be with Him and have relationship with Him. Throughout all of history, God has been calling His people into relationship. That's what the cross of Christ was about was the ability to have right relationships so that we, the people of God, could come back and know Him and, and walk with Him and be intimate with Him. It's always about relationship, right relationship. And yet, it's also about warfare. But if you look throughout the Scriptures, you look at the Old Testament, I know some people that, you know, are offended at the themes of war in the Old Testament. It seems that, you know, there's so much blood and so much carnage you know, it's like, it, it, it's like watching one of those action films in print. There's always warfare going on in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it was in the natural. In the New Testament, the warfare is in the spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, it was external or outward warfare. It was the people of God were supposed to, you know, do some things. And in the New Testament, after the cross, now the warfare is internal. It's spiritual. It's going on. And some of us have, have forgotten or are, you know, not cognizant of the fact that, 
Yes, it's about right relationship with God, and there's going to be a battle. There's going to be a fight. You remember the old song? Some of you probably, I don't know. Some, I have not heard this song forever. You know, and some of you can help me because you don't want me to sing on my own. Promise me. I promise you. Yeah. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry. I may never. Come on, do it. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. Why don't give up on me? Come on, you don't want me sing. Come on. Ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over land or sea. I am the Lord's army. Yes, sir. So you see, we've forgotten this. That we are in the Lord's army. We are in a battle. You know, the New Testament even talks about the spiritual battles that we face. And the fact that we need to put on the armor of God. You know... This is worth writing. Vision attracts attack. Vision attracts attack. And if you're, if, you're in a, if you're in a place where there's vision, there's going to be attack. If you're in a place where there's vision, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be people that don't always get along. There are, will be those that irritate you and you irritate them. That goes along with vision because the enemy hates vision. And in any place, any home, any marriage... Any, any relationship, any church that has vision is going to have attack. Let me say this. Let me put it this way. If there is no conflict and there is no warfare going on in your life, well, it's probably indicative of the fact that you're already in the prison camp of the enemy. Because if there is no warfare, something's not right. Because the Bible is, is thematically from cover to cover a story of the fight to become all that we're supposed to become. And you, maybe you're in prison and you need to you know, capture that, the spirit or the essence of that, that great movie. And the young people will not relate to this movie. The Great Escape with Steve McQueen. You know, or they planned and they purposed to dig tunnels or get through the fence, over the fence, through the fence, under the fence, however. But they were going to get out and escape from that prison. Now listen, the Bible is very clear. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus told us that he was going to build his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Shall not, will not, cannot prevail against it. But the fact that he said that is telling us that the gates of hell are going to try and come against you. They'll not prevail. They, they don't have the right. They don't have the ability if you don't let them. Jesus is building his church and he has given us the keys to the kingdom. We have authority both on heaven, in heaven, and on earth with those keys to bind and to loose. This is what he told us. What are we doing with them? Yeah, we are in an army. We're in the army of God. The army, and if you think of it in the natural, you know, we have an army, the United States Army. But that army is broken down beyond that. There has to be, uh, you know, smaller uh, breakdowns and units and divisions. Just like in the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes in Israel. And by the way, this is why I don't have a problem with denominations. Or with other churches. Because there were 12 tribes in Israel. Each tribe had its own particular characteristics. Each tribe had its own destiny. Each tribe had its own call. The Bible says there are streams, plural, that make glad the city of God. You see, we need other expressions of faith in order to complete the whole package. To make the, the universal church, the army of God, what it is. Just like there were 12 tribes, but one Israel. They were all just Israel, but there were 12 individual tribes with their own characteristics, their own strengths, if you will. Well, when you think about an army, you've got your main army, and then there's a field army. You know, there's a subset of that army. And then within that subset of the army, there could be a core, which is smaller, and then a division, which would, you know, a core would be made up of some divisions. And then, and then with the division, you would have within the division brigades. It just gets, 
you know, smaller and smaller. And you have a battalion. And then you might, you'll have a company. After that, a company is 100 to 130 soldiers. And then the platoon. And then a section. And then finally a squad. And within the squad, you have a fire team. And a squad is usually eight, eight to ten soldiers. And a fire team is about four. And a squad and a fire team consist of that level that you have at that time is a band of brothers. It's like that epic television show that they put out. A group of men that trust each other. That live and die and breathe based on each other. They're successful because of the, what the others do and the alertness and, and they're dependent, they're, co they're dependent upon each other. And they wouldn't dare strike out on their own. They have to go as a team. And in order for an army to be successful, it requires chain of command. You have to have a clear chain of command. And even greater than that, you have to have, you have to have connection to that chain. You have to be submitted. And on beyond that, you have to have loyalty to the mission. If you don't understand the mission, if you don't understand the vision, then how can you be loyal? How can you follow the orders that the commander is giving to you? But remember this. Vision attracts attack. Anytime and anywhere you begin to have purpose and walk in your destiny and follow the plan and purpose of God, there will be an attack against that. You think about it in, in terms of the movie Saving Private Ryan. That epic battle that ensued on, the, on Omaha Beach during the Normandy invasion. In the movie, it's 27 minutes of brutality, of amazing, just yuck. I had to shut it off the first time I watched it. Got about so far into it and I had to shut it off, walk away process and then come back and start the movie over again. And yet I'm told that that's just the tip of the iceberg of the reality that happened there. What they were able to do in the movie, and the movie is graphic. I do not recommend anybody with a weak constitution watching that movie. But nonetheless, this movie is significant to, to, to understand the fact of being in an army and, and what it means. And you understand that in this story, in Saving Private Ryan, the, the storyline plays out that there's an alert clerk stateside that notices the death of a family member, the second death of a family member, three deaths. A family, the Ryan family, had four sons engaged in the, in the field, and three out of the four were killed within just days of each other. And that alert clerk realized that there was a mother that was going to get those telegrams all on the same day. But oh my. And so back then, it was customary for the last surviving heir of the family not to be sent to war. In order to save the future generations, in order to save the posterity of the family, the name of the family. And so the mission came down. Three of the four brothers are dead. And so now the, the army is going to try and retrieve Private Ryan. The only problem is Private Ryan was a paratrooper. And he drifted behind enemy lines. And he was MIA missing in action. They didn't know where he was at. Enter Tom Hanks and his squad of seven men. So eight guys, this squad going in behind enemy lines, this band of brothers. And they had to make decisions. And they had to be loyal to the mission, loyal to the vision, to the hope of rescuing this one man to bring him out so that there could be future generations of Ryans. The stakes are high, ladies and gentlemen. They were very high in that film. And that's fiction. And the fact is, in our generation, the stakes are also high. The stakes are eternal. I'll remind you of some statistics that I brought in the past. 1.78 deaths per second. Almost two people, every time I click my fingers, have passed away. 
the time we get done here today, there will be nearly 10,000 people have gone into eternity. Just the time that you have in church. Think about that. The stakes are high. But yet Jesus, Jesus has given us a commission. And you know, in the military, when you receive a commission, you receive a rank. You receive duty. You receive responsibilities. That's what a commission is about. And we have received from our Lord a great commission. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We see this in Matthew, or Mark 16. To every creature and he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. We understand that we have this commission. And yet... Understand this, this is a co-mission. You're not left to yourself to do this. Look at this next passage in Luke chapter 10. As we go, as we go into all the world, we need to understand that Jesus is there with us. And it says in Luke 10 verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others. And I bring this passage into the record because a lot of people say the Great Commission was, well, it was really to the apostles. To go and preach and to do the signs and the wonders. and Well, these, this group of 70 were not apostles. They were just followers of Christ. So Jesus, yes, appointed the apostles to go. He also appointed each and every disciple, each and every follower of Christ to go. And notice this, though. He sent them two by two. Two by two, it's a co-mission. You're not alone, but you should go. It's a co-mission. Now, even going further, check this out. Get this revelation in your spirit. He sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. You need to understand that you're perfectly suited. You're perfectly capable. You are able and everywhere you go, Jesus is there with you. He has already prepared you, and He has gone before you. And that that moment, wherever, if it's at the job, at home, wherever you are, God is with you. And He will give to you whatever you need in that moment. Because He's gone before you, and He's sending you. He's prepared that moment for you to be there. We're not alone. It's a co-mission. He is with us. And when we go, we're called according to our text to preach the gospel. Now you know that I am big on lifestyle evangelism. It's more about being filled with Christ and filled with the nature, maturity of Christ, being Christ-like than just going out and standing on a street corner or going knocking door to door. I'm not dissing those things. If that's your call, so be it. But as a Christian, each of us should have enough Christ within us that our lifestyle is evangelistic, that it attracts people, that it makes people want to know more about what we have. And yet, the challenge today the Holy Spirit has for us is to ask us to check our confession. Where are we at? What, what is coming out of here? What are you saying? Are you like one of those Eeyore Christians? You know, Eeyore is living in a perfect world. He's living in the 100 acre wood. Eeyore has a wonderfully loving master in Christopher Robin. He's a loving young man. And he takes care of his, his friends. And he plays and engages with them and talks with them. Eeyore is in a perfect world. And yet when Eeyore looks at the sky... And it's blue as blue can be. And there's not a cloud there. He'll say, well, I think it's going to rain. <laughs> you know, for Eeyore, the sky is always falling. For Eeyore, everything that could go wrong will go wrong. And he speaks that. He talks about that. He lives that. He's all mopey, you know. He's just like those other Christians that are baptized in pickle juice. Got that sour face on. You know, you can tell they're really happy in their faith. What's in your heart? 
You see, our lifestyle should shine the grace and the gospel of Christ. We should, we should have a smile. You know, it's easier to smile than it is to frown. It, it uses more muscles to pull it down than to pull it up. More muscles are engaged in frowning than there are in smiling. Just easier. You know, there's a better question than what we hear, you know, on that television commercial about the credit card. It says, what's in your wallet? The better question is, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if we're always complaining, you know, I be very transparent, I always... I always, I loved my grandmother, okay? Grandma's house was always a fun place. But I didn't ever enjoy just hanging out and listening to her. I loved getting together with the cousins and, you know, and the family. We were just crazy and had a lot of fun. But Grandma was always, oh, my bursitis. Oh, you know, I went to the doctor and he said, and oh, I got this and I got that. And I'm, uh, you know, oh, and I'm just not feeling that good today. And, but that was every day. Every day. What's, what's coming out of your mouth? What's your confession like? What are people seeing through your life? Because they're watching. Are you bringing a negative perspective to Christianity? What's your confession? Life is hard. Life is not fair. Well, who said it would ever be fair? Was it fair to Jesus? Not at all. It wasn't fair to take those stripes, those beatings, the mockings, the scourgings. Listen, the stakes are high. Salvation is on the line. We're supposed to be engaged with seeing people get saved, giving them an opportunity by lifestyle, by what we're saying, by how we're living, how we are expressing the gospel in us and through us. You know, it's sad. I actually had a neighbor die about two weeks ago. Came home after a Sunday afternoon. We didn't know what was going on. And police cars all over the neighborhood, other cars everywhere. Finally, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, rescue unit shows up and of course it was too late home alone and I'd only met him once only had to have the opportunity to meet him once but it's things like that that bring a sobriety to you that you go ah, if only I never had the opportunity to engage him in conversation about Christ you see the stakes are really high the eternality of another life, like my neighbor. The future of generations, like Private Ryan and his family. The possibility. You see, there's always been warfare. From the very beginning, you think about Moses and what he went through. And, and get this. Moses, when he was a child, Pharaoh put out a decree to have all the young men slaughtered. Because the nation of Israel was becoming too strong. And they were afraid that they might rise up. And then the Egyptians would be in trouble. So he says, oh, let's just kill all the men. All the young boys. So there was an abortion of a generation. And when Jesus came on the scene, there were prophecies. And when the king heard of the prophecies of this Messiah, this deliverer being raised up, all of a sudden there was an abortion of a generation. He sent out a decree to have all the children, the male children, two years and younger, killed. And today, our government is involved in the abortion of our generation through Roe versus Wade. We have the same warfare going on in our country now. Now it's not a pharaoh, now it's not a, a king or a ruler, but it's our own government. So there's always warfare going on about them. The enemy tried to kill them. It's important for us to be engaged in this war so that we can find those who God is touching, God is calling, and we can hone our sharing skills. We can become better at being what we need to be so that people will want what we have. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He who wins souls is wise. Let's just
stop and pause on that for a moment and catch some concepts. You see, you don't just go out and start winning the world. You don't just go out and become Reinhard Bonnke tomorrow. You don't become Billy Graham tomorrow. But this scripture gives us a principle. The fruit of the righteous is like a tree of life. If you start with the seed to grow a tree, you don't have a tree tomorrow. You get a seedling first. And you have to nurture that seedling. And that seedling has to have seasons, years to grow into a tree. And a tree, after a certain amount of time, has the ability then to produce fruit. But even fruit goes through a season. When the tree is mature enough to bear fruit, it first buds. You have the beautiful little flower out there on a branch. And through the process of producing fruit, that beautiful flower that you so appreciate in the spring wilts and withers and dies and goes away. And then there's this little bump, little nubbin or something, and it's like a lump on the end of the stick. And it starts to swell and grow. And pretty soon you have whatever fruit it is, whatever kind of tree it is, whether it's an apple, whether it's an orange, whether it's you know a, a, a peach or a nectarine or cherries, whatever it is, then the fruit comes. But you get the point. It takes time. And it takes process. And when you're dealing with trees, and trust me, those on the east side of our state know how to process. They know the art of growing trees and the art of producing fruit. And good fruit comes through good pruning. And pruning is not always fun. But pruning is necessary. And pruning is painful because they cut back the branches so that there could be more fruit. See, that's conflict in action. <laughs> conflict has a way of honing your skills. Fruit takes time to develop, but you can perfect that art of growing your tree, building yourself up in your most holy faith, and allowing the fruit of the Spirit to come out of your life. And it, the purpose should be so that we can be a good witness for others. And Jude 1 verse 22 tells us that there's two different kinds of people that we need to be aware of in this world. Two different types. It says on some having compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You see, the two people, the two types of people I see in this verse, the first one are explorers. There are those that are curious. Those that you know, will ask questions. They want to know more. They want to experience. They're, they're not afraid to engage you. They're not afraid to ask questions, even if they're, if they're not Christians. On those, you should have compassion. They, you should work with them in mercy and grace and truth. Being patient with them. Sowing seeds and watering seeds. You need to know, though, how to make a distinction between those who are explorers, who are curious about eternal things and spiritual matters, and then the group I call the crashers. And the crashers are those people in life that they have to hit the wall. They have to run out a rope. They have to hit the, the lowest point. They've got to come to a point where there's drama or trauma in order to shift their focus and their thinking. In order for them to open up to hear any other perspective, life has to fall apart. Those are the crashers. And they don't, they don't change until they're confronted with trauma or drama of a major sort. Then they make a life shift. These are the ones that where you practice confrontational evangelism, where you give them the word of God and pull them right out of the fire. Let them know that it's turn or burn. You know, there's only two places to go here. But you have to be able to make the distinction. You have to know how to draw that line and know the difference. You don't go to the explorer and tell them, Heaven or hell. Make a decision. Oh, you work with them. You're patient. But the person in trauma or drama, you need to be straight up with them. Get to the bottom line. Help them to know it's either this or that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a war zone today. 
And we are, you are, behind enemy lines. But right now you're in a place of respite. Right now you're in a place, you know, where you can take it easy. You can kind of relax. But when you leave here, don't let it be so. Even at home, you need to understand the enemy is after your kids. The enemy is after your marriage. The enemy is wanting to do things. To divide and, and conquer and to discourage and cause you to go a different way. People's eternality is at stake in this war. After all, there's only two outcomes to life. Smoking or non-smoking. That's it. Really is. What are we doing? What are you doing to make a distinction? Have you given yourselves to understanding that you have the keys to the kingdom? Have you figured it out that you have those keys and that the gates of hell shall not prevail in your life? The gates of hell do not have to prevail in the lives of those around you. You have the authority to bind and to loose things in heaven and on earth. What are we doing to make a difference? Are we connected, gentlemen, to our band of brothers? Sisters, have you found your band of sisters? Have you joined the sister chicks? Are we open? Are we even open to allowing the Lord to use us in the salvation process of others? You see, there are some Christians that are so quiet in their Christianity. They think that if I'm quiet, the devil will leave me alone. Well, guess what? You're probably right. But if you get too quiet, you just might be the one that's in the prison. Because Christians should not have a void of conflict. We live in a war. There was a war from the beginning... There will be a war all the way up until Christ returns. For crying out loud, what does the end of the book say? He's coming back on a war horse with a sword. Just, I'm just saying. We are in a war and we've forgotten that we're in a war. Have you drawn up the list of those in your circle of influence? We talked about some weeks ago. Do you have a list of names of people that you're trying to make the distinction? Are they explorers? Or are these going to be crashers? Are you been praying for them, asking the Lord to give you insight in how to engage them and talk to them? Have you asked the Lord to, to put within you a word, some strategy so that you can connect with those people? Or are we just coasting? Have we even created that list? Do we know who's in the bullseye? Whether they're family or friends? Do we know the next level of relationship? Do we know who's, where they're at? In that circle of influence that we all have. Who are your band of brothers or sisters? Who are those that you can trust your heart to in the battle? Will you stand with me? And I'll ask you this last hard-hitting question. Is your life attracting people to the gospel? Or does it distract them from the gospel? Are you an Eeyore? Or are you a Tigger? Full of life or full of gloom? Which is it? I dare say it should be one way or the other. Jesus said I would that you're hot or that you're cold. Don't be lukewarm. Don't be caught in the middle. Because the ones that are caught in the middle are in the most trouble. Jesus wants you to be Red hot on fire so that you can light fires. Or absolutely cool so that you're refreshing. Cold ice water on a hot day so that you provide refreshing. 
hot or cold, not lukewarm. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to make sure and give an opportunity if there's anybody here today that has never made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. And your heart's pounding within you and saying, I need to get to know this guy, Jesus. I need to be a part of this thing they call church. Have a right relationship with God. Would you just put your hand up really quickly? Nobody else looking around. Anybody, anybody need that miracle in your life today? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Secondly, are there those here today that are willing to say, Holy Spirit, partner with me. Help me to be available. To make a distinction. To be ready to minister to those around me. Whether it's with grace and patience or whether it's with fear. Help me to know the difference when and what to do. Help me to live a life with purpose in that regard. But if you're here and you know the Lord's been stirring you to do that, go ahead, sig signal heaven, say, Lord, that's me. I want to be more available to you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the response of your people. I thank you for the implanted word, the seed of the word of God. And I pray that the seed that we've received today would, would be planted in good soil. And it would be nourished and watered. And it would develop into a tree of righteousness. A tree of right living and right thinking and right acting and right doing. And that that tree would produce multitudes of good fruit. Fruit that lasts. Fruit that others can enjoy. Fruit that's attractive to people. And will cause them to come and explore the tree because of the fruit. Lord, bless those that have responded today to that end. Seal this work and this word to them. Lord, draw them forth in this generation to be lights in the darkness. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. And all the receivers said, Amen. And finally, if you had any other need, whether it's a specific prayer need, a physical touch, you know, even Jesus, when he healed the blind man, he said, what do you see? And the blind man said, well, I see men like trees. So Jesus had to take two shots. That's Jesus had to take two shots at that guy. So we already prayed during the worship service. But if you received a touch and the enemies kind of come after it already and you want more prayer, we have prayer team partners here that will pray with you. Whether it's for physical healing, the completion of that healing, the sealing of that healing, or any other need. You need a job. You, you've got a specific something that you're facing, they'll be here today to pray with you. Avail yourself. The effectual, fervent prayer of righteous people does great things. And that's what they're here to do and partner with you. In. Otherwise, God bless you. May the peace of our Lord be with you. Shalom. Shalom.